board also. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Today, the scientific snack is with uh, uh, Sir Joshua Evers. He's doing a fantastic job in the phylogeny of turtles, understanding more about the, um, the anatomies, mainly skull anatomy on turtles, and using a lot of uh, CT data uh, uh, for that. And um, thank you very much, uh, Sir Joshua, for doing this, this talk and coming for our scientific snack. Next week, at the same hour, we're having the presentation of the Geopark OS, which is um, a, a strategy for development of this area in Portugal using geology as the main uh, driver. And the week after this, it will be, be, be dedicated to the plesiosaur evolution with uh, Benjamin Keir. So don't miss those talks. The first will be in Portuguese, the second uh, uh, in English. Without further ado, thank you very much, Joshua. The audience is yours. Well, thanks very much for the introduction. Uh, and like Octavio already said, my name is Sayosha, Sayosha Evers. Uh, lots of people call me Yoshi. So if you ever come across that name, it's either uh, the Japanese uh, person studying hardware source or that's me. Um, and I did my uh, PhD at the um, University of Oxford with Roger Benson as my main supervisor. And my thesis was co-supervised by Paul Barrett at the Natural History Museum in London. And uh, after I graduated uh, from Oxford in 2018, I moved to Switzerland to work with Walter Joyce uh, on the right-hand corner here, who's at the University of Fribourg, where I am a postdoc now. And uh, obviously, I have to thank many people because I do specimen-based research. And so this is just a list of people that I'm very thankful for providing access to specimens and also CT data. So I study turtles. Um, it's actually not changing. Let me give me a second. Okay, there we go. So I study turtles, and turtles are a relatively species poor clade of reptiles with only about 350 living species today. But despite this, turtles are relatively disparate in terms of their ecology. So we have turtles that are entirely terrestrial and even habitually burrowing. We have turtles, um, lots of turtles that are semi-aquatic, so they spend a significant amount of time both in water and on land. And we also have sea turtles, which are really well adapted to living in the ocean, like this leatherback sea turtle in the top right-hand corner of this slide. And uh, the fossil record of turtles sh shows us that turtles were already disparate throughout most of their um, evolution throughout the Mesozoic and beyond. For example, in the, top left, uh, in the bottom left here, you see a highly terrestrial Mylani form, which uh, even has a tail club, so it's heavily armored. And on the bottom right, you see one of those derived protostegids. Uh, this is the Archelon specimen in Vienna. And you can sort of see here that it has a reduced carapace, so adapted uh, to marine life. And uh, in a recently published paper by Terry Cleary and colleagues, uh, the authors summarized all the turtle occurrences through time from the paleobiological database. And uh, what's apparent from this graph is that first, uh, the first stem turtles appeared during the late Triassic about 230 million years ago. And ever since then, turtles sort of diversified. And you can see from the number of dots uh, spread across the paleo latitude here that we have quite a lot of turtle fossils um, in museums. And uh, turtles in general are a little bit understudied, although they have such a great fossil record. And that basically means that there are lots of specimens in museums that have not been described so far. And I just want to illustrate this with uh, these three fossils here at the bottom row, which I happened to visit last week in several smaller museums in the Solnhofen region of Germany. And all of these species are new to science and are completely undescribed and they're complete. Uh, imagine, you know, many people get excited about a half a bone of a dinosaur somewhere from North America, but actually uh, in turtle research, you can go to any museum in the world and they have full specimens that are just lying there ready to be described. Uh, because turtles are a bit understudied, there are many questions uh, regarding their evolution that are still uh, not clarified. Even the origin of turtles is not really clear. We do have mo a molecular evidence that turtles are closely related to archosaurs, to crocodiles and birds, but 
we so far lack the morphological evidence to back this up. So there's lots of stuff to do on turtles. I've already hinted at turtles being relatively disparate in terms of their ecology, and that allows us to study ecological transitions, uh, um, which is an interesting sort of macroevolutionary field of research. And because turtles are still extant, they provide the opportunity to include data that are not available for other secondarily marine groups, for example, such as plesiosaurs. For example, we have DNA for turtles, and we can also include physiological observations made from actually living turtles today. In my research, I do a lot of CT scanning, and I probably don't need to explain this a whole lot, but you subject a specimen to x-rays and you get a series of slides uh, with density contrast from an object, and from that you can then use 3D segmentation to arrive at 3D anatomy. And this is uh, just an example of a model of a Sandonia turtle, Sandonia in ventral view, and I've color coded all the different bones. And this uh, digital dissection that I basically do is great for describing osteology, but also, for example, neuroanatomy, both of which I sort of do in my work. I use all this anatomical data, osteological data that I gather from my CT scans to look at turtle phylogeny. And the phylogeny in conjunction with this anatomical data can then be used to address questions regarding functional morphology and to look at morphological evolution through time, which I, for example, do with landmark analyses. As sort of a nice side effect of the kind of work that I do, I produce all these uh, sort of digital anatomy atlases, more or less. And uh, I can write sort of easy descriptive papers about that. And I've been relatively productive in this regard. For example, this is a paper I published uh, with my supervisors in 2019 about the anatomy of the protostegate turtle Rhino Kelly's. This is a, pa uh, the, a paper about Sandonia that I recently published with my now supervisor or PI here in Fribourg, Walter Joyce. And this is actually a paper that's scheduled to come out tomorrow. Uh, so watch uh, Twitter and social media or your email alerts uh, if you're interested in turtles and we have new exciting information. The CT scans uh, can also be used to look at internal features of skulls that are otherwise hard to see or hard to study, such as neuroanatomy, for example, the nerves or the blood vessels of turtle skulls. And again, because turtles are extant, we can also do fancy things like using MRI scans or stained micro CT scans to look at the actual soft tissue of organs. What you see here on the right hand side, for example, in brown is the actual brain of a living turtle. And in red, you can see the actual inner ear organs or so the membranous labyrinth and the yellow stuff are the actual nerves and not just the nerve canals as you would usually expect to see them in endocasts of fossils, for example. I've already stressed that I'm uh, doing phylogenetic work and I do that because phylogen uh, phylogenies are really important for studying evolution. For example, they allow you to, uh, uh, to get a grip on the sequence of morphological evolution and they also provide relative and absolute time frames for evolutionary events. Uh, through phylogenies, you can also study the process of evolution itself by, for example, looking at adaptation versus convergence. And you need phylogenies to document all kinds of macroevolutionary patterns and study exciting things such as extinction dynamics. And for turtles, again, because they are extant, we have molecular data uh, that we can use to constrain the phylogeny of modern turtles relatively well. And this is sort of a consensus topology following the paper by Pereira and colleagues from 2017. And I don't want to dig too much into the detail of the interrelationships of individual extant turtles, but just to show you this group here, I hope you can see the mouse. Um, these are uh, Pleurodires and the rest of the turtles here are Cryptodires. And those are the two main divisions of extant turtle groups. And cryptodires uh, are distinguished from pleurodires by the way with which they retract their necks underneath the shell. And cryptodires do this in a vertical fashion by retracting them in an S-shaped curve, whereas pleurodires tuck their heads sideways underneath the shell. And you can hopefully see this a little bit here in this Shelodina, which I photographed in the Sydney Zoo last year at SVP. It can sort of tuck its head sideways underneath the shell. Also, uh, there are osteological differences between cryptodires and pleurodires. And one of the sort of most commonly known one is uh, the mechanism with which these turtles uh, redirect their jaw adductor musculature 
over their OTIC uh, uh, process. And in CryptoDIS, you basically have a concave joint surface here called the otic trochlea, over which the jaw musculature directs. And pleurilaires have a similar mechanism, but in a different anatomical place. They have the trochlea in a more anterior position and formed by the pterygoid. And that is sort of a classic osteological feature that helps you to distinguish between CryptoDIS and pleurilaires. Naturally, people have sort of applied this before. And so, um, for example, the earliest turtles that we know, the earliest stem turtles, like Proganichelis here from the late Triassic, doesn't have any of this sort of mechanism. And so we expect it to evolve somewhere towards the crown group. And then people have found fossils, like, for example, this Sonhofia from the late Jurassic of Germany and neighboring countries. And you can clearly see that it has this otic trochlea, just like a cryptodire. And consequentially, people have interpreted this fossil to be a fossil cryptodire. However, later studies of anatomy have found that some early stem turtles, like this early Jurassic Caliente Kellys, already incipiently have the otic trochlea and have many other cryptodiron features as well. So it turns out that many of the features we see in cryptodires today are already present on the stem lineage of turtles. And therefore, it's really hard to use those kinds of features to uh, find out whether things like Sonhofia are actually cryptodires or whether they may, might be some sort of stem turtle. And uh, to illustrate this further, these are five groups of Mesozoic turtles that are now entirely extinct, which are the Xingyan Kelids, then the Cyanomidids and Macrobanids, Thalassochelidians, Sundonids, and Protostegids. And all of those five groups are exemplary for uh, the difficulties with which we can fit in fossils into a living framework of phylogeny, because we don't really know where any of these groups really go. Interestingly, three of those groups, the one to the bottom here, are secondarily marine. So uh, depending on how they are interrelated with one another, but also with modern sea turtles, we might have just one or many uh, independent transitions to marine life in turtles. Uh, I just want to show you a few pictures of fossils, because fossils are always nice, of one of those groups uh, for which we don't really know their placement, and those are the protostegids. And the earliest protostegids uh, are things like Santana Kelly's from Brazil here to the left. And you can see on the scale bar, it's a relatively small turtle and it has adaptations to a marine life, but it's not generally interpreted to be a very good swimmer. Uh, this is different in more advanced protostegids, like this gigantic Archelon here in Vienna on the right, uh, which has sort of proper flippers, a highly reduced carapace, and is generally interpreted to be a pelagic diver. So people naturally have tried to fit these fossils into phylogenies and the first sort of global approach, including many fossil groups along most of the accident groups, is the seminal work published by Walter Joyce from his PhD in 2007. And some of the groups that are going to be important for the remainder of this talk are highlighted with color codes in this slide and in some of the following slides. And it doesn't really matter where they are specifically, but I want to contrast this phylogeny with a different one that was published almost 10 years later. And you can see that many of the groups are either polyphyletic, paraphyletic, or in completely different places. And again, I want to highlight protostegids, which Walter Joyce found to be total group cryptodires, so on the stem lineage of cryptodires, but Kedina and Parham found protostegids to be the sister group of modern leatherback sea turtles. And so at the beginning of my PhD, the aim was to summarize the existing morphological variation that we can observe in turtles and also extend the data set that already existed by novel observations guided through my CT work. Um, I wanted to focus on marine groups, but analyze them in a global context because many of those other groups have actually influences on, top on the topology of those other groups as well. So it's important to sort of look at the entire picture of turtle evolution and not just pick specific groups and just look at those. Um, through that work, I wanted to generate new hypotheses and to check the character evolution regarding marine adaptations and address questions such as how many transitions were there to marine life in turtles. And so my approach was to take this 
uh, constrained or relatively well-known phylogeny of modern turtles and fill it with morphological data that I gathered through CT scanning. And so I scanned approximately 120 species of extant turtles. That's about one third of their modern diversity. And I've documented their uh, cranial anatomy and looked at the variation that exists between different groups to familiarize myself with the anatomy. And then I basically threw in fossils into the mix. In total, I have nearly 300 turtle specimens scanned, covering all major extant and extinct fossil groups of turtles. And uh, yeah, I'm using all of this anatomical data to uh, work on phylogenies. And one, things that I, one thing that I really try to do seriously in my work is to illustrate and annotate and explain all the character modifications or the novel characters that I come up with, uh, which is important not only for reproducibility in general, but also to understand the characters that I, for example, newly phrase. Because any of you who have ever worked with phylogeny will know that sometimes you just read someone else's character and you don't really know what's going on or what's meant. So I think it's easy these days to illustrate things and we should do so. Um, based on the data, I could really sort of tickle out some anatomical details that are otherwise tricky to see. As an example, here on the right side in the scoffer tortoise, uh, you can see a trough on the dorsal surface of the vomer. And the vomer is a bone that is sort of tightly integrated into the palate of vertebrates. And so its dorsal surface would usually face the interior of the eyes. And it's hard to see that in osteological specimens. And in fossils, you might even have matrix concealing this area. So without CT scanning, you cannot possibly even see those characters. And so this way I sort of generated new observations that people couldn't really make before the age of CT scanning. Um, what's really critical when doing phylogenetic work is thinking hard about characters and homology. And there's a large body of literature from the late 60s, early 70s, up to the 90s that strongly discuss different concepts of characters. And in generally, uh, I followed the hierarchical multi-state coding strategy uh, proposed by Hawkins and colleagues or summarized by them in 1997. And I paid great attention to split independently varying observations into separate characters. And so if any of you are interested in sort of character or making of characters, character coding, I would strongly recommend you read the three papers cited on this page and also the references within to familiarize yourselves with the concepts. Uh, but I'm also sure that many of you will be familiar with them anyway. So in the first phylogenetic study that I published coming out of my PhD in 2019 with my supervisor, Roger Benson, we had 80 taxa and 355 characters. And then slightly later, we added some postcranial revisions, which weren't really the focus in the first paper as well. And I'm still developing my data set now with Walter Joyce. And we've again revised some characters. We threw more taxa in. And I'm currently at 130 taxa, but the latest sort of update of the main matrix isn't quite published yet. And what I've generally done in most of my analysis is uh, constrain uh, the topology of accent turtles according to a molecular backbone that follows the molecular consensus published by Pereira and colleagues from 2017. I've also used different character settings, such as equal weighting or implied weighting, which tries to downweigh uh, homoplastic characters. Uh, I've used unordered versus ordered character states and experimented with those. And in general, I've been using TNT for my cladistic analyses. However, I've also used Mr. Base and Bayesian statistics, which are nice because they allow you to incorporate prior information into uh, the generation of topology, such as age data, which is going to be important when you want to have time calibrated phylogenies. And I'm going to come back to that at a later point in the talk. So this is the result of sort of my first paper. And I use the same color codes. And protostegates are highlighted in brown and indicated by the arrow. And we find them basically uh, within modern sea turtles. When we use slightly different character settings and slightly different data set, we remove protostegates from outside the crown group of chelonioids and put them in the stem of chelonioids. So they're sort of proto sea turtles, but still really closely related to modern sea turtles. And this is the same when I basically use Bayesian 
methods as well. And so there are three topological findings that I want to uh, point your attention to in basically all of my phylogenetic work so far. And those three are protostegates are either total or crown group telonioids. And like I just said, depending on the setting, it varies a, a little bit, but it's somewhere up there. Then I found uh, that secondarily marine turtles from the Mesozoic form a single clade that includes the thalassochelidians like the plesiochelids or Solnhofia with Cretaceous syndonids. Cynamidids and xinyankelids are always found as stem group turtles in my phylogenies, whereas they have been found to be stem group cryptodires in previous works, for example, of Walter Joyce or Martin Rabi. Uh, what's interesting is that those... <laughs> What's interesting is that those three topological findings are true regardless of the methodology that we apply to our data set. So it doesn't matter whether you use, for example, ordered or unordered characters, those three statements are always recovered. Interestingly, we even recover these results if we don't constrain the molecular backbone constraint, which if you don't do that in turtles gives you funny results in terms of the interrelationships of modern clades, but we still find these statements to be true. So that basically points to the possibility or what we think is that, that we have found a relatively robust phylogeny of turtles. However, we anticipated that at particularly parts of the turtle community would be critical against our results. And so we really scrutinized our data by applying some alternative hypothesis tests to our data. And one of the things that we did is using Templeton's tests. And in the Templeton's test, you first use your regular phylogeny, which is this one here, and the phylogeny will have a tree length. And the tree length is basically the sum of morphological steps it takes to acquire this phylogenetic topology. What you can then do is define a certain taxon or an entire clade to be something else. For example, we constrain protostegates to be stem group uh, cryptodires or to be stem group turtles as they were recovered in some previous analyses and then re-ran the analysis including this constraint. What this gives us is a tree with a longer suboptimal length and then we can use statistics to basically uh, compare this length with this one and we're basically asking the question how much worse is the suboptimal tree and for this particular test so removing protostegates from uh, uh, away from modern sea turtles, it is really, really cost parsimony costly to do that. And uh, we could statistically reject the hypothesis that protostegates are basically anything else but uh, stem group sea turtles or even crown group sea turtles. Another uh, thing that we did to scrutinize our data is to delete characters that we suspect to be important for marine adaptation. And uh, this is because some people have said that protostegates are likely only found to be modern type sea turtles because they do something similar in their ecology to modern sea turtles. And so we identified characters that pertain to the formation of flippers, for example, and deleted them and then rerun the analysis. But even uh, excluding those marine characters, we find protostegates to be total group telonioids. So overall, we think that our uh, results are relatively robust, or basically as robust as we can get them with our data set. So now that we have relatively robust phylogenies, we can have a go at actually studying marine adaptation. And there are three things that I'm primarily interested in. One is the flipper evolution within telonioids. Uh, there have been hypotheses, for example, by Hirayama from 1998, that uh, leatherback sea turtles and hard-shelled sea turtles independently evolved flippers. And so that would mean multiple flipper origins within modern sea turtles. And I wanted to test whether that's actually true. Also, um, because we found those uh, Mesozoic uh, secondarily marine turtles, the Angular Kelonians, to be in a different clade from modern sea turtles, we have several transitions to marine lifestyle. And so we can ask questions, do these different groups uh, adapt to marine life in a similar way or in a different way? And the third uh, aspect of research that I'm interested in is whether we can find neuroanatomical adaptations to marine life. And so starting with the first line of 
research, uh, the sort of clearest morphological adaptation to marine life is the formation or the development of flippers from more terrestrial hands. And you can see a terrestrial turtle hand here on the left hand side and a flipper from uh, the Cretaceous Allopleuron on the right hand side. And I just want to highlight a few differences between those two. You can see in the more classic hand that you have nicely developed joint surfaces, whereas in these guys, you basically have highly reduced joint surfaces and the finger elements can actually not move against one another as well as these can. So you can't really flex the fingers if you're a marine turtle. Also, obviously the hand itself is much longer, the individual elements are longer, you have a reduction of the claws, and you also have flattening of, uh, of uh, elements. And so I've looked systematically at features of turtle hands and then optimized those hand-based characters onto my phylogenetic topology. And what I find is that at the base of sea turtle, modern sea turtle evolution, there are bursts of innovation and the, uh, those fundamental traits of flippers, so, so the most important changes such as the flattening of the elements, the mobility reduction between the individual digits happens early in turtle evolution. And then we also have some later bursts of innovation, which sort of modify only smaller aspects of flippers, such as the relative phalangeal lengths to one another. And so in summary, we can say that there was a single uh, evolutionary origin of the flipper in modern sea turtles. And then subsequently, there were smaller changes that modified uh, those hands further. But what about those non chelonioid marine turtles? So those uh, Jurassic and Cretaceous marine turtles that can be combined in the clade Angola colonia. Do they have proper flippers? And if so, is the sequence of evolutionary innovation similar to the one we see in Chelonioid sea turtles, so in sort of proper modern sea turtles? And in order to address that question, we obviously need a postcrania and flippers of these guys, and they're, they're not um, super common, but we do find lots of uh, Thalassochelidians, Angola colonians in Sonhofen. And when you compare the different Sonhofen fossils, you can see that there is morphological variation with the hands. For example, in this guy here at the bottom right, you can see that there are clear joint surfaces developed, whereas in this one here, the joint surfaces are reduced. So we assume that this is a more flipper-like animal or hand than this one with reduced mobility between the digits. You can also see that there is taphonomic variation between these two hands. This one has basically its fingers all intermingled, while this one has the hand lying on the, on the substrate surface on its palm. And so we think that basically there was little connective tissue between the individual fingers in this turtle, which allowed its hand to sort of fold over the way it did. And there is some tentative evidence for that coming from soft tissue preservation that you also get in the Sonhofen type fossils. In this fossil, for example, you have a scaly pattern of the lower leg, similar to modern sea turtles as well. And you can see here, I hope it, it comes clear in, on your screens, you can sort of trace the envelope of the webbing of um, uh, soft tissue material between the hands. And what's also nice in the Sonhofen fossils, if you expose the fossils to UV light, like down here in the top right hand corner, you can see that there sometimes is actual soft tissue preserved between the digits, clearly showing that this was sort of a proper flipper. Um, another organ that's really interesting in terms of its ecological adaptations is the inner ear or labyrinth organ, which basically is a series of canals within the skull of vertebrates. And uh, there are sort of two functional domains of the inner ear or labyrinth organ, uh, which are morphologically uh, separate as well. There's the ventrally uh, positioned cochlea here, which basically governs hearing. And then you have the uh, semicircular canal system, which consists of these canals. And that's important for balance, for orientation, but also for head and gaze stabilization and neck head coordination. And those semicircular canals or the morphology of them have uh, an expected close link with locomotor ecology. For example, increased radii of the semicircular canals should in theory lead to an increased sensitivity of the organ and that should in theory lead to an increased agility or ability to be agile as an animal. And that is exactly what we find with empirical 
uh, data collected by mammals. And this is taken, for example, from a publication from Spore and colleagues from 2007. And you can see here, this is the radius of the semicircular canals and it's plotted against body mass. And on a log scale, there is a linear relationship between these two, but also variation in this dimension. And you can see the red triangles, which are faster mammals like this bush baby, they all have relatively large canals, whereas some slow animals have relatively small canals. This sort of small size is taken to an extreme in cetaceans, so in whales and dolphins, which in this graph would plot somewhere over here. And you can really see how tiny those semicircular canals are. So I had the question, can we also see similar patterns in the labyrinth uh, models of turtles? And so I've done what I'm best at, and I took the uh, sort of CT data that I have. Uh, I segmented about 150 ear models of extant and extinct turtles. And we can already uh, qualitatively discern some patterns. And one of those patterns is that within sea turtles, so those are all, all sea turtles, this is a stem sea turtle, so a protostegid. Then we have the modern Caretta Caretta, and we have the deep diving uh, leatherback sea turtle. And you can clearly see that from those shallow divers towards the deep divers, you have an increased thickening of the semicircular canals. And the interesting thing is that the same trend is paralleled by other secondarily marine reptile groups. For example, in 2017, uh, my colleague and friend James Neenan, together with some other authors and myself, published a study in which we document this pattern for sauropterygians, so plesiosaurs and their kin. And you can clearly see that in this near shell nothosaur, you have really thin canals, but in the pelagic uh, pliosaurs, you have much thicker canals. A paper that's relevant to this has uh, recently been published as well by Julia Schwab from Edinburgh, and they document the same pattern for uh, marine crocodiles as well, which is also interesting. But for turtles, this observation so far has only been done qualitatively by us, and so I also wanted to quantify that pattern. And I'm basically using landmarks uh, in Aviso that I put or place around the uh, semicircular canals. And uh, then I'm also taking the uh, phy phylogeny and the non-independence of phylogenetic data into account by using phylogenetic comparative methods, such as phylogenetic generalized uh, least squares regression analysis in R. And this is one of those regression analysis. And what I've plotted here on a log scale is the circumference of the anterior semicircular canal against the labyrinth size. And so now uh, we can see that there is a positive relationship between the two. But you can also see that there is quite some spread across the trend line. And basically everything that's above the trend line has relatively thick semicircular canals. And everything that's below the trend line has relatively thin semicircular canals. And so now we can ask the questions, do sea turtles actually have thick semicircular canals? And the answer is, Yes, they do. At least modern chelonioid type sea turtles, including their stem groups, so protostegids, for example, they all lie above the trend line. For Jurassic marine turtles, so angular chelonians, the trend is not that clear, and there are quite a few sort of excursions below the trend line, uh, uh, which is not shown here and uh, which I'm currently still working on. Quite interestingly, and maybe unexpectedly, um, this sort of thickening of canals is not unique to sea turtles, but we, for example, also see that terrestrial, highly terrestrial testudinates, so testudinates are exclusively terrestrial, um, and they also have really thick semicircular canals. So that basically tells us that the thickness of semicircular canals itself cannot be used as identifying the ecology of an animal, which is important for fossil-only groups, like, for example, also potentially sauropterygians or other animals. Uh, obviously, sauropterygians are not terrestrial, but I'm just saying that people should be careful when basically doing uh, these kinds of statements without having any neontological data to compare it with. So the question remains, why does the circumference actually increase, for example, in those sea turtles? And uh, is it a signal of the actual organ? which could indicate a sensitivity increase of the organ because the thicker the canal, the more sensitive the inner ear becomes? Or is it only a signal of the cavity? Because obviously for most fossils and also most recent species, those are only uh, the sort of infills of the canals. And so they're an approximation of the actual organ, but they're not 
like the actual organ. And nicely, turtles are extent, so we can actually look at the actual organ, which I did here. So the red things that you see are the membranous labyrinths that I've segmented from stained micro CT data or MRI data. And you can very clearly see in this demo Kelly's that the thickening of the end osseous canals is not mirrored by the membranous ducts. And that basically means that demo Kelly's has more space around its ear, its inner ear organ, than the other turtles. And this space is usually filled in an animal by a fluid called perilymph. And we don't exactly understand the physics of this system very well at the moment, but we assume that this is some sort of diving adaptation. Obviously, that doesn't work for testudinates, uh, at which we are also looking at the moment. We also want to test for general or other ecomorphological signals in turtle ears. And so what I've been doing here is I've been reconstructing the inner ear fluid flow of turtles based on comparisons between the actual organ and what we commonly have available, which is the end osseous labyrinth. And you can see this is my reconstruction from this end osseous labyrinth. And uh, I have to check with, yeah, this one, this thick blue line uh, is uh, derived, it's a, a center line or a skeleton of this model, whereas the um, dotted line is a skeleton of the soft tissue model. And those are actually quite similar. So I think my reconstruction method works quite well and I can use my reconstructions to put landmarks on and basically examine turtle labyrinths uh, in greater detail than, than people have before. Um, so I have about 150 ears scanned and all major turtle clades are uh, characterized uh, by landmarks. And you can see here in this other PGLS analysis in which I have the labyrinth centroid side, size plotted against the skull length, that there is a positive relationship. But again, there is some spread across the trend line. And basically everything above the trend line this time has proportionally large labyrinths when compared to skull size, whereas things below the trend line have uh, proportionally small labyrinths. And this is sort of analogous to what's, what I've been showing you earlier about mammals. Um, patterns or to derive patterns from this is easier if you actually examine the residual plots rather than the actual uh, regression analysis. And so a residual plot is sort of a turned version of this where the trend line suddenly becomes horizontal and then you can observe the spread a little bit in more detail. And one of the interesting things that we've sort of tickled out of this is that the early stem turtles for which we have ears like Cayenta Kelly's and we also by now have Programma Kelly's but it's not yet included in this data set. It plots somewhere around here but for the purpose of the talk I left it out. And you can see that they have relatively small labyrinth sizes but already on the stem but slightly in more crownward positions other stem turtles like Singyang Kelly's for example have much larger labyrinths. So there is a trend across sort of early turtle phylogeny to increase the ear size and we don't really know why that is. For marine turtles, which I unfortunately didn't label but they sort of fall out around here, based on comparisons with whales and dolphins we might expect them to have particularly small labyrinths but as you can, well you can't see but you have to trust me now, uh, as marine turtles plot around here they don't have particularly small labyrinths and so they don't really fulfill the expectations that we have for them. Similarly, Pleurodires, which sort of move their head uh, in a much more agile way than other turtles do, were expected to have really large labyrinth sizes. And the Pleurodires this time are color coded in blue, and you can see that they're all over the place. So they also don't really fulfill the expectations that we would have based on mammalian data. Uh, for testudinates, uh, they all plot in the lower end of this distribution, meaning that they have relatively small labyrinth sizes for their head size. And that is sort of expected because tortoises are the most sluggish of all turtles. And so we would expect them to have a relatively low agility and relatively small labyrinth sizes. Interestingly, this small size is also secondarily because we know from the previous slide that turtles evolved large uh, ear sizes to begin with, so this must be a secondary, secondary reduction to small sizes. Another thing that we found that is peculiar is that turtles have really huge inner ears compared to their skull size, 
when compared to other animals. So this is a turtle with the actual sort of proportionally scaled NAER plotted on top of it. This is a bird, this is Struteo camelus, and you can see it's much smaller in comparison to head size. And this is a Heterodontosaurus tucky, so a dinosaur, and it has a relatively tiny NAER in comparison to the head size. So we don't know why turtles have such huge ears, and that is something that we're actively researching at the moment. I've been talking a little bit about cladograms, and they're nice because they allow characterization of some evolutionary patterns, such as I did for the flippers. But many macroevolutionary analyses really require a time frame and branch lengths in order to do some analyses. And there are different ways to arrive at time scaled phylogenies. You can, for example, take an existing uh, cladogram and R posteriori scale it in R with methods like the minimum branch length method or also slightly more sophisticated probabilistic methods. Even more sophisticated are Bayesian tip dating methods in which you use uh, age information of the fossils during the process of calculating the phylogenetic topology. For the remainder of this talk, I'm going to show you a, a time-dated tree that I've uh, constructed with the easy uh, minimum branch length method. And one thing you can see from this time scale phylogeny uh, is when certain things originated or when certain clades originated. And I've color coded in blue here the main secondarily marine lineages of turtles. One are the Angola Kelonians, which originate in the Jurassic here. Then within, Bothram within Florida, you have Bothromidids, which originate in the Cretaceous. And then you have the, uh, uh, the total group of sea turtles with crown group sea turtles and protostegates, so their stem lineage originating sometime in the Cretaceous. And what's really interesting here is that all of those three groups lived at the end of the Cretaceous and survived the mass extinction that's associated with the end of the Cretaceous. And this is very unusual for marine reptiles because other marine reptiles that lived during those times, like plesiosaurs and mosasaurs, go entirely extinct. So turtles seem to be resistant uh, uh, to the uh, end Cretaceous mass extinction, and we currently don't properly know why. Possibly it is related to their diets, but that's also something we're looking in in future research. Another thing that these timescale phylogenies are helpful for is basically further scrutinizing our hypothesis to begin with. One problem that my uh, hypothesis brings about is uh, those red arrows, which are relatively long ghost lineages for certain clades of turtles, which means that during those times, my phylogenetic hypothesis implies that these groups here should already be present, but we're actually not having any fossils for them. And, um, I'm, and this is the, or the reason for this is basically the old age of protostegates, which I've repeatedly talked about uh, during this talk. And you can see protostegates here, and they really sort of push the origination of uh, sea turtles into the early Cretaceous and thereby creating those long, uh, long ghost lineages. And that is a bit of a problem. Uh, this is just a different way of basically showing the same thing. Again, you have arrows showing the ghost lineages, but what I wanna show in uh, this slide is two things. First of all, I've color coded um, the uh, different groups according to their biogeography. And you can see that the earliest sea turtles that we have, or the, the most basal ones, I should, the, the earliest branching sea turtles that we have are Cretaceous. Uh, also, uh, these guys are largely Cretaceous, the earliest fossils, and the sister clade, Chilodroidea, are also Sorry, I said Cretaceous, but I actually meant North American. So let me start again. So Chilutroids, the sister clade to sea turtles, are North American, and the earliest sea turtles that we have are also North American. Um, so that's one thing I want to show here. The other thing that I want to show is that alternative hypotheses like the one published by Walter Joyce in 2007 also require long ghost lineages. They're just in different parts of the tree. So I don't actually think that ghost lineages in my hypothesis are such a huge problem because ghost lineages in any phylogeny are sort of expected. And now I'm coming back to the biogeography of things uh, because these clades are North American. Um, the entire origination of chelydroids plus chelonioids is expected to have happened somewhere in North America. But in the early Cretaceous, where we have these long ghost lineages, we have a notoriously poor 
a terrestrial to sort of shallow marine fossil record. And so maybe the fossils could actually be there, but we don't really have the rock record to find them, uh, which would basically mean that the, uh, the ghost lineages are only an artifact of uh, discovery. Um, another consequence of the early age of chelonioids induced by the pro uh, position of protostegids is that some of these other clades have, uh, must have originated earlier uh, in the crown. Um, so what's next from here? So one of the things that I'm actively pursuing at the moment is I'm doing lots of Bayesian phylogenetics with fossilized birth death models as tree priors to sort of further scrutinize the origination of, uh, of uh, chelonioids in terms of their timing. Then I'm also looking at flippers of basically non-chelonioid Jurassic and Cretaceous marine turtles, the Angular chelonians. Then I really need to push my inner ear stuff, which has been in the making for quite a long time, and we're sort of hopefully getting closer to publishing that. And I'm also still uh, really engaged in descriptive work and trying to sort of publish uh, both redescriptions of existing specimens and new specimens so that other people can use the uh, morphological anatomy that we document. And uh, in summary, uh, you can, I think, say that the high resolution CT data uh, that I and also other people obviously have gathered can be used for multiple lines of research, which is nice. And in terms of, um, uh, of results, we find strong support for protostegids to be probably stem group chelonioids. Uh, I also uh, sort of newly recognized that Mesozoic marine turtles, so some donuts and thalassochilidians, form a single clade. Uh, we have two major non ploridarian transitions to marine life, those Angola chelonians and chelonioid sea turtles. But in total, there are actually many more because there are several independent marine transitions in Ploridais, which I've not talked about today at all. All marine turtle groups that lived during the end Cretaceous also survived the extinction event, which is definitely noteworthy. And uh, the chelonioid flipper evolution shows bursts of early evolution and then subsequent modification later uh, during their evolution. Jurassic marine turtles show some flipper diversity, differences to modern taxa, but it's also clear that at least some uh, Jurassic marine turtles did have proper flippers and were thus relatively well adapted to swimming at sea. We have possible marine diving adaptations in the end osseous labyrinth of marine turtles by their uh, sort of excess perilymph surrounding the inner ear organs. And uh, the labyrinth evolution of turtles shows some unexpected trends that could not be uh, predicted based on mammalian data, which also indicates that maybe the hypotheses that have been extrapolated from mammals onto other groups need to be scrutinized further, because maybe some of those dynamics are not as uh, universal as previously thought. Um, the total group of Chelonoidea is older than previously thought based on the early age of protostegids, and that basically requires that modern cryptodiversity already started to be established earlier in the early Cretaceous than previously thought. And uh, with that, I want to thank you all for listening, and I hope that you have some questions for me. So, Yosha, this was amazing. Thank you so much. Thanks. Um, we are opening for, for questions.